It's April 26, 2024. This is the Room Now Podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush. Great to be with you today. We're going to review a few things, including news reports and journal things I thought were exciting. I want to start by a few things I tweeted out this week that uh, stem from my rewriting my chapter in Harrison's textbook on the evaluation of musculoskeletal complaints, some facts and figures that I think there are tidbits that you may find interesting or not. But um, I'm always looking for the most updated numbers on the frequency of musculoskeletal disorders and how basically how important a rheumatologist and the overall care of the public. Um, and I've often quoted a number uh, of about 20 to 25 percent of people presenting to their primary care doctors will present because of a musculoskeletal complaint. And that turns out to be all consistently true. The latest number I came up with from the UK was 21.1%. Um, the numbers sometimes range from as low, low as 14%, as high as 25%, meaning that the musculoskeletal complaint is the primary reason for the evaluation. Of all primary care evaluations, of all patients who seek out medical care, at least 50% of people have musculoskeletal problems and or complaints. Hence, yes, you are very, very important. I was writing about monarticular disease, um, and I one of my examples of that is sarcoidosis, so I dug up some papers on that, and the articular manifestations of sarcoid can be a few. Uh, I must say in my career, uh, I've seen mostly monarticular, oligoarticular, ankle involvement predominant. Now, occasionally, you see a finger that looks, you know, just wildly abnormal, and it's due to sarcoid, either of the joint or the bone. Um, but there's sort of an acute arthritis and a chronic arthritis. Acute seems to be more common than chronic. One of the common uh, test questions, of course, is Lofgren syndrome. That's the triad of sarcoid arthritis enodosum with bilateral hilar adenopathy. Um, and then when it is acute arthritis, it tends to be more large joint oligo and ankle predominant. And that's always the case, I think, in Lofgren's. It seems like it's always ankle involvement. The uh, other uh, manifestation would be chronic. And you can see tenosynovitis, dactylitis, erosions, jacudes, um, and occasionally something that may look like a rheumatoid, but generally these are the less common features. Another report that I um, puzzled about was the frequency of hydroxychloroquine-induced hyperpigmentation. Uh, we've all seen it. You know, what happens with uh, drugs like gold. When we were growing up in rheumatology, we used a lot of gold. And uh, hyperpigmentation, a slate, gray appearance to the skin and patches or um, was called chrysiasis, but it also happens in, uh, in the case of using hydroxychloroquine. Um, I always thought it was pretty uncommon, not rare, 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 but uncommon. Like, and I found a few literature reports saying it's about 5%. But this particular study coming out of um, China uh, looked at 316 patients on hydroxychloroquine, and 26%, what? 26% had um, uh, hyperpigmentation or lesions that were hyperpigmented, uh, um, and they followed these people for 6 to 30 months on this. There was a delayed onset. You had to be on the drug uh, for a median of 12 months before it happened. Um, the median cumulative dose of, of hydroxychloroquine was 108 grams. They saw it on the face, 60%, legs, 30%, hands. They said that sun exposure was protective, and, I, and that was significantly so. So I kind of disbelieve the magnitude of the problem that they're reporting in China. Maybe that they're looking for it. These were rheumatologists. These were not, this was not a dermatology department study. But nonetheless, it's going to be somewhere between 5 and 36%. Uh, a study of 25,000 older adults who had fracture looked at the uh, effect of having comorbidities with that. And in fact, having multimorbidity as measured by the Charleston Comorbidity Index really changes the outcomes here. You know, obviously fracture is probably going to be associated with 
uh, falls, it might be associated with a higher risk of subsequent fracture. Well, if you had um, a Charleston comorbidity index of two or three, that you had a 25%, up to 25% higher risk of another fracture, and you had a twofold increase in mortality. But if you had a uh, Charleston comorbidity index of four or more, these numbers went up a lot more, up to a 48% um, increased risk of a second fracture and a fourfold higher risk of subsequent death. So people who are fracturing and falling with comorbidities, you know, they get a, you know, a red flag that they get to wear around as far as how much you're going to worry about them. Do you worry about what the ultimate diagnosis of seronegative RA is? Again, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Ronan Kavanaugh taught me that if you're seeing a seronegative, this is something he learned from one of his mentors. If you're seeing a seronegative, every visit is sort of an invitation for you to reconsider the diagnosis. Uh, and, and there's a nice, nice study by Tuliki Soka looking at the outcomes of, I think it was over 300 patients with seronegative RA. And, um, and, you know, actually a lot of them had other diagnoses. And high on the list was calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. In this particular study of 364 RA patients, 26% were seronegative, 96 patients. Amongst those 96 patients, 18 patients met criteria for CPPD. Those patients were more likely to be older and more likely to have, as you would guess, acute episodic arthritis. So again, think about it when you're seeing a seronegative. Uh, Medscape this week reported on the STEP9 study, which was reported uh, in Vienna just uh, last month at the ORSI, or World Congress of Osteoarthritis um, meeting. The STEP9 is a multinational phase three randomized controlled trial of semaglutide in, uh, or, or placebo in 407 OA knee patients. And they had to have knee OA, Kelgren grade two or three. Um, who had, and they also had to have pain um, and a BMI that was greater than 30. Uh, and the mean BMI on that was uh, 40. The mean pain on that was seven. The one, Womack pain score was 7 or 71 out of 100. Uh, at week 68, those that were on the semaglutide um, had significantly lower, significant lowering of their uh, Womack pain scores by minus 42 compared to placebo minus 27. That was highly significant. They had more weight loss, 13.7% lost weight versus 3.2% on placebo. Um, and the question, of course, is, was it the weight loss that accounted for the magnitude of pain reduction? There are other studies with this class of drugs, these GLP-1 agonists, that show they may have some role in osteoarthritis. I don't think it's fully worked out that it's not just weight loss that's uh, improving their pain. There may be other immunologic and anti-inflammatory um, benefits that I don't think we yet know about. We know that from other studies where we've talked about these drugs being used in gout and in RA and in patients with autoimmune disease in general. So um, interesting data. Uh, we do talk a lot about ILD. It seems like it's a hot topic in the last few years and maybe with good reason. JAMA had an interesting review, a nice overview of ILD, if you're looking to learn more, it affects 650,000 patients in the United States uh, and leads up to 30,000 deaths per year. So its occurrence, especially in our patients, can be viewed as a very um, worrisome event. Um, CT scans being the diagnostic tool and they talk about the use of antifibrotic and or immunosuppressive uh, therapies that may be instrumental in changing or leveling out the outcomes of these people who are sort of have a poor prognosis. Um, more on ILD, CTD ILD, a study, a single center study of 173 patients. What do you think their diagnoses were? Um, highest on my list, I was surprised. Highest on this, their list, I was surprised because it wasn't on my list. 34% had Sjogren syndrome. Wow. 30% RA, 25 um, systemic sclerosis, 6 UCTD, 3% with idiopathic inflammatory myositis, and 1% or so with either MCTD or lupus. Not surprising, right? 
uh, for the latter part of that. But for the front part, I would have guessed RA and systemic sclerosis, not so much uh, Sjogren's, but then again, maybe it's something we need to pay attention to. NSIP was the most common uh, uh, presentation of ILD in Sjogren's and scleroderma, whereas UIP was more common in RA. In their 172 patients, um, six were died during their follow-up period, mostly from secondary infections. Another study of, um, of aggressive therapy in RA, nothing to do with ILD here. These are 50 patients, um, and this was in Frontiers, that looked at the combined use of low-dose IL-2 therapy with an IL-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab. So either you received nothing, control, IL-2 low-dose, 26 patients, uh, or nine patients with the combination and 15 controls, all the patients improved clinically uh, as measured by multiple measures, including DASH-28 ESR. But the main point of this paper, limited number of people that they treated, was to look at what happens to T-cell subsets. And they showed that, that the combination therapy um, produced a significant reduction in Tregs, um, specifically with greater decreases, or also with decreases in Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells. Um, Treg numbers did correlate um, significantly with uh, um, the ESR. I think that was an inverse correlation. So um, again, I think that this is um, interesting for a number of reasons. One, um, they're experimenting with the use of combination therapy. Um, previously verboten in RA carrier, but we're now seeing it going on in other um, disorders like IBD and psoriatic arthritis. There are trials underway with combination biologic agents. And will that come up again? Historically, it's been said it didn't give you much in efficacy and it only increased your serious infection rate. Um, this was a preliminary study not meant to prove this point, but I think it's headed in the right direction. You uh, may have seen this news this week about in Oregon, they passed a law that physician assistants are now having a title change to physician associates. And that starts in June of this year. Um, this was contested by the AMA. Um, this only applies to physician assistants, not nurse practitioners. And the question is, why do this? Well, there's a growing need for um, physician associates and nurse practitioners in the delivery of healthcare. You can't do it all. And if you're not employing a, an advanced practice provider like a physician associate or nurse practitioner, you're making a big mistake. Um, you train them and, um, and it's amazing what you'll see as far as your practice. Uh, I, I've always had uh, nurse practitioners, and I had one physician assistant work with me in the past, and it's always been a great positive experience. So I put it up there because I think it's the way we have to go if we're to deliver competent uh, care to people with musculoskeletal disease. You just can't do it all. A worrisome report from the pediatric literature that if you uh, have, if you're taking care of kids and kids that are diagnosed with an uh, an immune-mediated inflammatory disease like lupus, RA, IBD, including type 1 diabetes, et cetera, uh, and their kids. Um, this Danish population study of, uh, of uh, almost 12,000 pediatric IMID patients versus 100,000 controls, 1.3 million patient years of follow-up. Um, they were older kids on average, 12.6 years, but the bottom line is that a three-fold, 3.8-fold higher risk of death if you had a pediatric diagnosis of an IMID disorder. So that accounts for about seven additional deaths per 100,000 kids. Uh, this was most significant for GI disorders and GI cancers, cancers and lymphoproliferative disease, less for our disorders, um, lupus, RA, JIA, uh, that sort of thing. But still, I think this is... Um, scary data that you should be aware of. St um, Stills disease, my, my favorite topic. Uh, I found an interesting report about renal manifestations of Stills disease, and I've had my fair share of this. I've had, you know, I've had hundreds of patients with Stills disease. I've had two um, renal deaths from amyloidosis due to Stills, and uh, uh, probably about 
maybe less than 10 overall amyloid cases. But in this cohort study of 44 adult stills patients, mean age 38, uh, renal onset um, was uh, usually after the diagnosis of stills. In 36 of the 44, they had biopsies. Most of them were uh, amyloidosis. A few were glomerulonephropathies or uh, thrombotic microangiopathies or, um, you know, sporadic IgA nephropathy. Again, um, there were more deaths in those who had renal disease compared to those who didn't. Uh, a press release this week from Avi showing pro- preliminary results of their phase three select GCA study. That means that they have studied uh, upadacitinib versus placebo in um, patients with um, GCA uh, for 52 weeks. Um, they had a remission rate of 46% with UPA versus 26% with placebo. Um, this was a steroid, aggressive steroid taper study in the first uh, six months, and they followed them out, out a year. This is not yet in print. Maybe we'll see this at ULAR or ACR this year, but that's encouraging. This is going to be a competitive market, GCA, is it not? Right now, we only have uh, um, a tocilizumab as an approved product, but there are studies going on with IL-17 agents um, and, and now JAK inhibitors. So uh, we'll be seeing that in the future. Two more reports. Uh, JAMA had this report about self-acupressure in uh, patients with knee osteoarthritis. This was a uh, 314 um, randomized control trial, older adults, um, and you either received just knee education or um, uh, they taught you how to do self-acupressure to do it twice a day. Uh, And I believe this was a um, just a 12-week study, uh, and there were a significant benefits to self-acupressure. Again, on a 10-point scale, it's um, minus 0.54 for the acupressure. It's not a big result, but nonetheless, people going into the study were um, different. They're not obese. They're um, only less than half of them were treated with Western medicine. Others were getting physiotherapy and Chinese medicine. Um, 10, 15% were on some kind of pain medicine. Their pain scores were 5 out of 10. So it wasn't severe NEOA in any way. But would that work? Teaching patients how to do acupressure. It's in, in and about the knee. That's which they do it. Well, it seems goofy. Yeah. But if it works, I'm all for goofy. I mean... It should so obviously going to be safe. I'd like to see more studies like this. And lastly, we had a, a, a report of um, lupus nephritis patients and their risk of progressing to CKD. 260 patients with biopsy-proven lupus nephritis, either membranous disease or proliferative disease, were followed for a um, median of eight years. Um, and while the membranous patients, as you might imagine, um, had less uh, lower serum creatinines overall, um, you know, 0.7 versus 0.8, that was significant, than did the proliferative patients. The bottom line in this study was that proteinuria did not, levels did not differ between the groups. Proteinuria was not predictive of the risk of progressing to CKD. The most predictive factor in progressing to stage 3 CKD, meaning a a GFR of less than 60 cc's per minute, um, was basically GFR, and that was most predictive. But the biopsy results themselves and proteinuria um, was not that predictive, and I think that's really instructive, and I'll use that to make my final point, which is that this week on Tuesday Night Rheumatology, we're going to do a replay of our session uh, from Room Now Live on lupus. And there's a, one of the three lectures we're going to review is uh, one by um, Andres Fava from Johns Hopkins, who's going to talk about biomarkers in lupus, specifically urinary biomarkers. And they are just kick-ass. They are so predictive. They, put, they correlate well with uh, histology, they correlate well with outcomes. They, they, you can correlate them with activity levels and not chronicity levels. I mean, it's really, this is the future of lupus care. Tune in on Tuesday night to um, see what Dr. Fava has to say. 
That's it for this week on the podcast. Go to the website, check out the show notes if you want to see these citations and more. We'll talk next week. Take care.